Let's see your Bibles. Let's see your Bibles today. Say word. Okay, let's try it one more time. 10 o'clock. Say word. Let's see your pens. Lesson plan. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We want to welcome everybody watching wherever they're watching from. Whether you're at a satellite location, online, at home, wherever you are, God bless you. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Lord, we just pray you bless our word today. Bless your word today in our hearts and challenge us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the Breeders' Cup 2010 horse race. It is a horse race at the end of the horse racing season. I am, uh, I've probably watched 10 horse races in my life, so I'm not a horse race guy, but I love if there's a reason to watch. Just it's a two-minute shot of adrenaline. And this year, uh, the Breeders' 2010 featured a horse named Zenyatta. Anybody heard of Zenyatta? Has anybody not heard of Zenyatta? Okay, Zenyatta going into this race, I guess he's excited, he hasn't heard of it. Zenyatta going into this race was 19 and 0. Uh, she won every race from coming from last, she was last place. So she's a heartbreaker. She would let everybody get out in the front, just kind of cruise in the back, and at the very end, break everybody's heart. She was 19 and 0. She's the only f uh, animal featured on 60 Minutes. And she, and she was also she was also one of the top 20 females in 2010. <laughs> beautiful brown, dark brown, black, almost horse. You know why's it got to be black? I don't know. You ask her mother, but she was just a beautiful dark horse. And so I, I just fell in love with this horse because she was you know she came from last all the time. And she just 19 and 0, and now she's at the Breeders' Cup. And the whole thing can she win this race? And she was going to retire after this race. And she figured if I, after I go 20-0, and 0, she'll be the only horse ever to retire undefeated. So here's how the race went. Now I'm going to ask you all to sit up in your seat, put your booty back a little bit. Get your hands like this. Grab your reins because we're getting ready to ride. We're getting ready to ride. You can just do this as a ride. Ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? They're off. And the $5 million Breeders' Cup Classic is underway. The field rushes toward the, ra the rail and already Zenyatta is dead last. Zenyatta got a slow start. She's about six lanes behind. And as they appro approach the first turn, first dude is first. Quality Road is second. Come on, ride with me now. Ride with me. Quality Road is second. Haynes Field is third and a bunch of other horses. Their names I don't know are back behind them. And Zenyatta is dead last. As they come out of the first turn, they're starting to spread out. Quality Road is first, Quality Road is first, Haynes Field is second, first dude is third, seven lengths back is the pack, and even further back is that, Zenyatta is dead last, that's right, Zenyatta is dead last, Mike Smith's asking her to pick it up, he's trying to make her go fast, she's 18 lengths off the lead, a length is eight feet, eight times 18, 144 feet, that's a long way, Zenyatta's really far back. Come on now, ride with me, ride with me. <laughs> First dude is first, Quality Road is second, Blame is now third, and as they come into the back turn, Zenyatta is still dead last, Zenyatta is dead last, she needs to make a move, come on, ride with me, ride with me, ride, Zenyatta is pinned on the inside, looking for a way to get through, and uh-oh, Moses must be a jockey because the whole pack opened up, here comes Zenyatta, Zenyatta is making her run, she's down the front stretch, she's running, Lucky is first, Blame is second on, on the inside, and Zenyatta is coming around the outside, 300 yards to go, come on, ride with me now, ride with me, 300 yards to go. Blame is in the lead. Zenyatta's picking up. Zenyatta blames. Zenyatta, Zenyatta, Zenyatta blames. Trying to hold the lead. And they're coming down to the wire. Zenyatta and blame wins by this much. She lost by this much. I watched this 15 times. <laughs> I've watched it three times today. Breaks my heart. I, I, I wanted her to win so bad. I, I literally probably watched five horse, I, I don't even think I watched five, ten horse races in my life. I've watched this horse race more than all of them combined. I was like, I wanted this horse, I wanted to, and, and by the way, she was the only female horse in the race. And I was like, come on, girl, come on, girl, come on, girl. And she's going and going and going. And you know what happened after the race? She went back to the stall and got some hay. People lost millions of dollars. Everyone's crying. I'm crying. I got stressed every time. I'm come on, girl. She's going to make it this time. And she probably had no, and this is, I don't know what's in the horse's mind. Don't know what's in the horse's head. But I bet you she has no clue. She just, no, I'm supposed to run around. I'll just run until he tells me to stop. 
We have to get, a point, a, a, a point, get to a point in our life where when God says go, we go with all our might no matter what happens. Amen. This is not about winning compared to somebody else, getting more stuff compared to somebody else, being first, second, third in man's kingdom. It's about when we die, God says, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, as we continue our series looking at how we understand epistles, let's look at our notes real quick. Just run through our notes real quick. We saw that the epistle, epistle is, an, is a letter. Everyone say letter. And when we read an epistle, there's certain things we're going to look for. One, who wrote it. In your notes, it says right there that Paul wrote the, the epistle to the Philippians. Who wrote the epistle to the Philippians? Say Paul. Paul. And he wrote it to who? The saints of Philippi. Say saints of Philippi. Saints. And number three in your notes is why was it written? To thank the saints and to encourage them in unity. And then it says, what does the author say about the issue that caused the letter to be written? So whenever you read an epistle, you want to ask these questions. And this particular parrot, this particular particular chapter, Paul says, I want you to press on to the upper call of Christ. That's what Paul's telling him. It's just a letter. He's writing to the, the saints of Philippi, and the chapter that we're going to read today, or the section of his letter, is simply telling him, I want you to press. Just like Zinjani was pressing. She was running her race. Press. Look what it says in chapter 3, verse 12. Chapter 3, verse 12. He says, I haven't gotten there. If you haven't gotten to where God wants you to be, say amen. amen. If you have gotten there, you're deceived. <laughs> you're, not, you're not there yet. It's not a bad thing. We're in process. And look what it says in verse 12. It says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold or apprehend that which Christ has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things that are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ. Here's what Paul's saying. There is an ideal, supernatural version of Paul that I haven't gotten to yet. When I say supernatural version, it means that, the, that if Paul submitted himself all his life to the, to the supernatural influence of Christ, he would be molded and shaped into something that he wasn't that day. He'd be a better prayer. He'd be a better, humble, more humble servant. He'd be more knowledge about who God was. He'd be more spirit-led, all that kind of stuff. And what he's saying is, I want to be that person. I don't want to be you. I don't want to be you. I don't want to be you. I says, I want to be that person. Now, Paul said, imitate me as I follow Christ. What he was saying, just like I'm following Christ, you follow Christ. But when you follow Christ, he's going to make you into an individual, unique person. You want to be that person. Every single one of you is unique, and when God reflects his glory through you, it comes out in a very unique way, but it always glorifies God because he made us all in his image. Matter of fact, if you have 20 diamonds, you know you diamonds have their own ID. You can ID them. They all have a twinkle, bling, it's called a bling factor. And what diamonds do is diamonds reflect light. They have no light in of, them, of their own. They reflect the light of God, the light, I'm sorry, the light that comes from the room. We are diamonds. We reflect the light of the Lord. That's our job. And so when God shines his light on us, his love, his patience, we reflect it out in our own unique way, but it always glorifies him. So Paul's saying, I want to be that person. God, what does a praying Paul look like? What does a humble Paul or more humble Paul look like? What does a more knowledgeable Paul look like? A better giver uh, Paul look like? What is that? That's what I want to be. So my encouragement to you today, and this is what we're going to talk about today, is that you would, you would say, Lord, I want to be that person. I don't want to just cruise in my Christian wall, well, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, whatever. No, no, no. I want to be pressing and pressing and pressing and running the race to win. doesn't matter whether you win in, in the man's world. When Jesus died, you know how much money he had? Nothing. You know what he owned? Nothing. He didn't have a place to live, sleep, lay his head. He says, I don't have a place to lay my head. You follow me, just know it's not about things. His disciples were running. He had no organization. He had no 501c3. He had no corporation. He died. That's not, that's not the goal. And he said, no, my kingdom is in heaven. Matter of fact, matter of fact look, look, look at verse 20. Well, we'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. Don't turn there. All you at home, don't turn there yet. <laughs> Let's look at our notes. Let's look at our notes. Uh, it says uh, under discover, right in your notes, first question we have to ch be challenged with is we have to press on in pursuit of God's supernatural version of ourselves. We just said that. We want to press on. Everyone say press on. Say press on. 
if we reflect on that, here's a question we have to ask right there in the, in the reflect. How bad do you want Jesus' righteousness? How bad do you want Jesus' power? How bad do you want fellowship? When I say righteousness, his rightness. The Bible says that our righteousness is like filthy rags. If you go into your kitchen sink and you open it, there's probably a rag down there. And when you bought it, it was nice and flat. Now it's like this. You pick it up and it doesn't even fall out. It's just like this. Because it's got guck in it. Say, you know what I'm talking about? You got to put it under the water to kind of get it out so you can wipe something with it. That's our righteousness, like a filthy rag. God, here's the best I got. It ain't good enough. But God, I did all these good deeds. Well, if you did it in your power, it ain't good enough. It's not good enough. I want my righteousness. Paul says, I want Christ's righteousness. Matter of fact, look at, look at verse, look at verse um, uh, 9. Verse 9. He says, I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. That's what I want. Then it says in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Everyone say power. And the fellowship of his suffering. Say fellowship. And I want to be conformed to his death. You want God's righteousness. You want God's power. Everyone say power. There's two kinds of power. There's natural power and spiritual power. Spiritual power is superior to natural power. Natural power is financial. You got money. Political. Uh, you got friends. You got a smile. You got a nice like that, that's power, all influence. All that power is inferior to spiritual power. Spiritual power is from heaven. Natural power is from man. God gives natural power to all of us or the opportunity to have it. And he actually gives us the opportunity to have spiritual power. Natural power you can take. You can manipulate. You pull people down. When you gossip, you're exercising power. In your mind, you're pulling somebody down to lift yourself up. Now, mind you, when you gossip and pull somebody down, you can't pull somebody down unless you're below them. In your own mind, anyway. That's natural power. We get, we fight and claw, and we see men doing that every day. Spiritual power you have to receive from God by faith. When Jesus was being um, on trial with Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate said, Don't you know I have power to kill you? Now, I'm going to paraphrase. It's not what Jesus said, but just work with me. Jesus did say, yes, the only reason you have that power is my father gave it to you. He gave political power, established government. God did establish government. God governs the heavens. He governs everything. He said, okay, you guys got government concept. So, yeah, Pilate, you do have power uh, to kill me. And he says, well, don't, aren't you scared of me, Jesus? He said, and I'm paraphrasing. Uh, no, I'm not scared of you. And the reason I'm not tripping right now, even though I know you're getting ready to kill me, is because after you kill me, three days later, I won't come back. <laughs> so go do what you got to do. He had spiritual power. Jesus was saying, the spiritual power I have is superior to the natural power you have. So go do what you got to do, then I'm going to do what I got to do. My encouragement to all of you, you don't want to thrive and, and focus on natural power. You want to aspire to spiritual power. And so what Paul's saying is that's what I want. I want spiritual. I want this power of Christ. I want his righteousness. So what do you do? Look at in your notes. Respond. It says, forget what is behind and reach for what is ahead. Everyone say forget. forget. Say reach. reach. Let's read. Look at verse, look at verse, look at verse, 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 look at verse 12. Not that I've already attained or, or, or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ laid hold of me. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended it. I'm not there yet. Everyone say I'm not there yet. That's okay. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press. Everyone say press. To the goal for the prize of the upper call of Christ. In your notes, letter A. Forget those things that are behind. Forget those things that are behind. What can they be? Right there in your notes. Negative friends. And we're going to read it in a minute. Y'all have people in your life who you need to get away from. They wear you out. They criticize you and discourage you all day. Criticize God. They influence you to do things you shouldn't do. 
sexual things, drug things, language, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can I get amen if you know what I'm talking about? Some of those friends, you, you, it is okay to say, brother, sister, we need a break. Because you're, you're, you are a ball and chain to me pressing and apprehending what Christ has apprehended for me. It's no good for me. And I, I gave you a space there, write in your own names. Who are those people? <laughs> it also says in there, uh, trash worldly idols. There's things in your life that are your idols. And by the way, in your mind, that's what identifies you. Your job identifies you. Your clothes identifies you. Your wealth or the wealth you're pursuing or the wealth you're building identifies you. Your status symbols. Paul says that's garbage compared to knowing Jesus. Look what it says in verse 2. Philippians 3, verse 2. It says, it says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. These are people he's talking about. The mutilation were the Jews that were saying you had to be circumcised in order to be a Christian. He compares circumcision to mutilation. Ouch. He's saying that's, all, that's, that's garbage. They're, 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 they're perverting the whole concept. It's when you get circumcised in your heart that you are saved. That's what Paul's saying. And Paul says in verse, in verse uh, 3, we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, who rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. And then he starts to brag about all the things in the world he could brag about. Now, when I tell you what he's going to brag about, I want you to think about the things you brag about or the things that you think identify you. The worldly things that you focus on that if you lost those things, you would lose your sense of who you are. Because they, 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 they don't identify you. God identifies you. His purpose in your life is what should identify you. This is what Paul's saying. He's saying press on and let those, let those things go. Look what he says in verse uh, 4. It says, though I might have confidence in the flesh, though I, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. In other words, if anybody could talk trash, it's me. That's what he's saying. Verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Why is that significant? Because in the Jewish culture, that's what they were supposed to do. Get circumcised on the eighth day. God told Abraham that. Of the stock of Israel, I was the tribe of Benjamin. There were 12 tribes in Israel. They split. They had a, a civil war. They split. Judah was the main tribe. Benjamin was the only tribe that went with him. He said, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the stock of Benjamin. By the way, it was also the smallest one, Benjamin. Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. Basically, I was the most educated. I was a Pharisee. I, I, I ascended to the top, religiously. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. I, Paul, arrested Christians. I killed them. Stephen, the first martyr, guess, guess who was standing there? Paul. His name was Saul at the time. So Paul's saying, I did all that, y'all. He's talking, yeah, I did all that. I, I, can, I can brag and brag and brag of how I was the top of, of our faith. And then he says, uh, verse 7, but the things that were gained to me, I count them as a loss so I can know Christ. In other words, in verse 8, indeed I count all things a loss for the excellence of of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish or garbage. In other words, when I compare all those worldly things to knowing Christ and having an experience with Christ and being forgiven by Christ and having the power of Christ, they can't compare. You want to brag? Yep, I played in the NFL, and every little kid I meet would want this compared to Jesus is garbage. For real, though, this jersey, it ain't worth anything. Someone else got this number. They make a whole lot more money than I made. Garbage. <laughs> Come to think about it, brother, is making some money, though. No? Magazine covers, hey, and so what? That was years ago. You didn't probably never even see it. It didn't mean nothing. This is a real Emmy right here. It's a real deal, not fake. There's my name right there. We had a, a, a documentary on crystal meth. Don't mean anything. You didn't even know I had it. Don't mean anything. Jesus. Paul says, I want you to identify those things. I want you to put them in the trash. And then I want you to follow me. We're trying to hold on to stuff. I got I to gotta make a lot of money. I got to get a big house. I got to do this. Well, you know what? If God wants you to have it, it will happen. Just do the best you can in following Jesus. Well, Paul says, look at your notes. Look at your notes. It says, A, forget those things that are behind. So first thing, first get rid of all the stuff that's entangling you. You know, what, you, know what, you know what happens a lot? We're trying to follow God. We're trying to follow God. But we got balls and chains. 
Don't raise your hand, but how many of you leave church and you go back into a world of cursing, pornography, drugs, alcohol, nothing that resembles Christ? And you go into that world and you're trapped. And you're trying to live for Christ and you can't. One of the, one of the most liberating things you can do is cut yourself loose of all that. Does it mean get rid of friends? Yep. Yep. Does it mean that you throw them in the trash? Nope. Those were the things. It means that you say, when I got saved, the, the guy that I was hanging with, was, I love him like a brother. Never stopped loving him like a brother, but he was no good for me, for my relationship with Christ. We'd be driving down the street. I'm saved. I'm a, I'm a pastor now. I'm a youth pastor, Christian. We're driving down the street. He rolls down his window. Yo, baby, you and me, yo, yelling out the window. I'm like, brother, you can't be doing that with me in the car. <laughs> We're like 20-something years old. The lady's 75. He's yelling at the lady. You know. <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating. That's, that's how he was. I'm like, listen, if you want to do that on your own, but you can't do that with me, one, I don't want to hear it, but two, you know, you can't. Ah. I had my daughter, I had my baby daughter. My, first, my daughter was like, you know, a week old. And he wanted to hold her. And I said, no. You know what he said? I understand. I understand. Because I know where he'd been. Was that harsh? No, I wanted to protect my daughter. My point is this, is that, yes, there's going to be some friends that you've got to go, you know what? I love you. I mean, we're boys or girls or whatever you want to call it. But I, it's holding me back. Because knowing Jesus and getting close to Jesus is way more important than all this stuff we do. Now, can you come back to them and try to pull them? Hopefully you do. Matter of fact, my buddy that I was telling you about, I can't find him. I've been trying to find him. Google, Facebook, he's nowhere to be found. I don't even know if he's alive. But I'm trying to find him. But the point is, is that Paul says, first you have to identify what you've got to get rid of. And then look what it says next in your notes. B, reach up for the call of Christ in your life. Reach. Everyone say Reach. R-E-A-H. R-E-H. First, trash what you got to trash, and then reach right here. Right here. This is where we belong. You got to get to there. What does that mean? You got to get to where you don't. It's not about you anymore. You got to die. When Jesus died, he was saying, this is what I want you all to do. Once you die. This ain't about you. Say it ain't about me. Everyone take a deep breath in. Exhale. Okay, we're going to say it again, but I want you to say it like you mean it. <laughs> take a deep breath in. Say it's not about me. That is so hard for us to believe. So hard for us to believe. When Jesus died on the cross, he was saying it ain't about me. You know why? Because right before he died, you know, he asked the father, is there any other way? Three times. Is there any other way? And the father said, no. Oh, I don't want to do this. Bleeding from his head. Look in your notes. Some of the ways you can do that is Bible memory. How often do you really, really, really remember Bible? We remember songs. We remember songs. You know, we sing them over and over and over and over again. We remember, we remember lyrics and we remember books. We remember all this stuff. We're going, what are we going to say to my girl? What are we going to say to this? We remember all this stuff. And what about the Bible? Word of God, living and active, sharper than the two of the sword. Over and over. Get a flashcard and take it with you every day and read it. Even if it takes you one week to remember one verse, just do it. That's pressing. Look what it says, you know, uh, a consistent prayer. How many of you all, don't raise your hand because I don't want you to be embarrassed, but how many of you, your only prayer is at food time? Dear God, please bless my food. Ain't nothing wrong with your food. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't thank God for your food. Okay? But if I cook the food, I'm like, yo, what, you, what are you trying to say? <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I'm somewhat joking, but sometimes that's the only prayer we pray. What about praying, dear God, I'm getting ready to go witness to somebody. I'm getting ready to go confront somebody in, in love. I'm getting ready to stand up for something and get criticized. Shadrach, Meshach, and the bad Negro when they were going in the fiery furnace. <laughs> Y'all go ahead and laugh. Y'all go ahead and laugh, but you need to read the Bible for all its worth. And they were getting ready to get thrown in the fiery furnace, and, and the flames came out of the furnace. They were tied up. The guys that were taking them to the fire 
the flames leaped out. This is in Daniel chapter 3. Read it for yourself. I'm not making it up. Daniel chapter 3, the fire came out and burnt up the dudes, throwing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego Negro in the fire. And the Bible says that the guys throwing them in the fire died. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this is my opinion. I wasn't there. After the dudes died, somehow Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went in the fire. How did they get in the fire? This is my opinion. They jumped in. They're dead. They can't push them in, they're dead. This is my opinion. I believe they were there praying, dear Lord, we're getting ready to get thrown in fire. Can you help three brothers out? <laughs> God called the angels, Gabriel, Michael, Tito, Jermaine, Latoya, get down there and help them. <laughs> they came down, the flames leaked out. Somehow the fire went around them and did not touch them. The Bible says that the, the smell of smoke was not even in their hair or in their clothes. That's what the Bible says. They fell in the fire. God says, now, this is the kind of prayer I want. Sometimes the only prayers we have is, God, give me more money. God, give me a woman. Give me a man. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Versus, God, I'm going to honor you. Can you just protect me? I'm putting my reputation on the line. I'm getting ready to put myself out there. God, I want, to, I want to serve you. I want to help somebody. What about those prayers? Press. Press. Sometimes we're just like, we're, we're, we're birthday and Christmas Christians. Gimme, gimme, gimme. That's it. Look, look what the next one says. Next one says, uh, just being obedient. <laughs> How many of you, you're pressing to be disobedient. In other words, you're driving somewhere knowing you shouldn't be going there. The light turns red. And God says, turn around, uh, 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 light turns green, you go. You make a right turn, turn around. You make a left turn, turn around. You turn the car, don't get out. You get out, don't walk up the steps. You walk up the steps, don't knock on the door. You knock on the door. And the whole time God's warning you, warning you, warning you, warning you. A, cat, a black cat runs in front of you. By the way, there's no superstition. It's don't, don't, yeah. But in your mind, God's trying to, I'll use anything to try to get you to go home. <laughs> there's no boo-doo, boo-goo, boo man in a, in a black cat. Why's it got to be a black cat? Yeah, wait, what's up with that? <laughs> White cat goes by, I got good luck. Black cat, I got bad luck. Okay. <laughs> and you're, you're being disobedient, 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 disobedient. And the whole time God's saying, what are you doing? And then you get busted. And the devil who his name is accuser accuses you before God. And you know what he tells you? God they sold out on you. And you know what he tells you? It's God's fault. And you know what we do? A lot of times, we blame God. And God's in it. He's like, give me another V8. <laughs> Look in your list. Confess sin. How about telling God, my bad. Everyone say, my bad. My bad, my bad God. My bad. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't worry. I shouldn't blame him. I shouldn't have criticized. I shouldn't have got, I shouldn't have, shouldn't have, shouldn't have, shouldn't have, shouldn't have. My bad. Hey, I'm sorry. Call somebody up. I'm sorry. So, uh, that's powerful words. Powerful. Service. Some of y'all do nothing for God. Nothing. And you want credit for coming here. You do everything else for everything else. Money, fine, but when it comes to God, I ain't doing that. God's like, well, why should I do anything for you then? You, you're, you're spiritually lazy, you're spiritually uh, scared, you're spiritually negligent, whatever you want to call it, you do nothing for God. What should you do for God? Everything. Everything. You should parent for God. You should be a spouse for God. And what I mean by that? In a way that honors him. You should run your business for God. Spend your money for God. Your time for God. It's all God's. You mean everything's for God? Yeah. Does that mean I got to do it all for the rock? No. That's not the point. When you go home and you love your kids, you're not doing it for the rock. You're doing it. You want your kids to know God. And you want to honor your kids so your kids can grow up to know God. When you, your employees know God through you, you don't have to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let them see it in your life. Let them see it in your heart and in your, in your passion. And then it says, uh, generous giving. Some of you guys give nothing to God because it's all yours in your mind. It ain't yours. 
God's. It's God's. You, we're lucky he only wants 10% of his money back. It's my money. Go home and tell God it's your money. And he can't have any. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do that. Just so you and him can be on the same page. Complete surrender. The bottom line is that Paul is saying, look, I want you to turn your back on your stuff. Turn your back on the world. You don't live here. Luke says in verse 20, chapter 3, verse 20. <laughs> this is a great memory verse. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for sa the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Your true citizenship is in heaven. Say, my citizenship is in heaven. But we live like we're citizens of the earth. We live like we're a Republican or a Democrat. We live like we're a, a non-denominational Christian or a Baptist or whatever. He says, no, excuse me, all that is, it means nothing. You got to live like you're a citizen of heaven. And the rules of heaven are right here. And the only way you can get right here and get with those rules is that you surrender to me. And you press and you press. I, I, I say, Zenyatta, is it, you, know, you know what Zenyatta is all about now? Having a baby. The she probably has no idea why she, they want her to have a baby. They want another horse that runs real fast. And all she's doing every day, waking up, so, uh, you got some hay? <laughs> I would love to go see her and meet her. Now, you may think that's crazy. That's fine. That's just me. And I was, I'd be like, you know, oh, Zanzada, you're the bomb. I was rooting for you. And she'd be like, who are you? <laughs> you got some hay? <laughs> <laughs> She's in a whole different world. We need to be like that. We, we wake up every day and say, Lord, I just want to please you today. And I want to focus, focus, focus on pleasing you. Here what are you going to do in a few minutes. The challenge to all of you is, are you pressing? Because you're in a race. Are you doing everything you can to apprehend what Christ has apprehended for you and become the person that God wants you to be? Some of you just need to ask your Christ to forgive you because you've never asked him to forgive you in the first place. And some of you, many of you who have already done that, you're just kind of cruising, going through the motions. And God is saying that is simply not good enough. It's just not. I want you to press. Because there's so much more fellowship with Christ. There's so much more power to be attained. There's so much more of his righteousness to be realized in your behavior. There's so much he wants to do in you and through you. And it's not acceptable to know that Christ died on the cross to redeem you, not just to give you salvation in a moment, but also to, uh, to, to you have to realize it through your life over time. That more and more and more you'll be able to reflect his holiness in your life. So in a minute we're going to pray, and you're going to have an opportunity to say, Lord, I want to press. Give me your hands like this, if you will, just one more time, just one more time, that you want to say, Lord, I want to take it up a notch. Yeah. I want to take it up a notch. Come on now, pick it up. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you love us. Thank you for the people who are praying and still moving their hands. <laughs> but you can stop, that's okay. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much that... You have a great plan for our life, things that no eye has seen, no ears heard, no mind can ever conceive. And we thank you so much that you are patient. But, Lord, there are people here today who want to forget what's behind. They want to even forgive themselves and forgive people. They've been holding burdens for years, and it's distracting them from loving you. If today you want to forget what's behind and reach for what's forward, pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I want to forget what's behind. I want to receive your forgiveness. I know you died for me and rose from the dead that I may be free. Please forgive me. I want to commit all my strength, my power, my heart 
to serve you. I want to press. I want to press on to be the person you created me to be. Thank you, Jesus. Eyes closed, heads bowed. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand if you prayed that prayer. If you want to press and forget and even walk away from what you're leaving behind. If you prayed that prayer for whatever reason, just stand to your feet and acknowledge God's forgiveness. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. 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 We see all of you stay standing. God bless you. We see you all over the room. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Very good. We see you. Stand up. Stand to your feet. God bless you. Very good. Very good. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. We see you in the balcony. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Good, good. Now we're going to ask all of you in a minute to come forward. If you're in North County or somewhere else, someone there is going to pray with you. So right now, and, and, and right before we ask these people to come forward, if you're in the balcony, all you have to do is walk up and the ushers will bring you down. And as these people walk down, I want to ask everybody else not to leave so we can make sure we get them all down here and celebrate with them. So right now, if you're standing up, just come up out of your seat and come on down to the altar and let's give them a hand. They come on down. God bless you. Stay right there. Stay right there. God bless you. Stay right there. God bless you. God bless you. How you doing? God bless you. Come on, let's give them a big hand. Come on, we got, we got to encourage them. God bless you. 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 You're welcome. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. God bless you. God bless you. You know, people come down here every week, five times a Sunday, crying. I have no idea what y'all are going through. And sometimes it's a real good thing. But God knows everything, and he is ready. Every single one of you is a very special person to him, and he is never distracted with somebody else's life. He is 100% focused on you and the person next to you at the same time. That's why he's God. That's one of the, one of the characteristics of him being God. He can do what we can't. And he loves you and he knows exactly what's been going on since the day you were born. Actually, before the foundation of the earth, he knew you. And so he is completely ready. He's just been waiting. He's a gentleman. He didn't force himself on you, even though guys like me yell and scream. He just wants to whisper, let's go. And if, and if he didn't destroy you by now, he's definitely not going to destroy you now. He wants to use you. And all you have to do is trust him. We know he's right. God's always right. Amen? And I want to let all y'all believe, all these people behind you, they could be standing here too. And they did at some point in their life, and there's a lot of people behind you, got worse issues than you, and God's going to, he loves all of us. So we're all in it together. We're all in it together. Lord, I pray for these people, and I pray you bless them. I pray they bless you. I pray they let you be God in their life. Not just a friend, not just someone who wrote a book, but God, Lord, Master, the one who we worship and obey. May we do that without hesitation. May you bless us, God. May we be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask all, all these people going to walk this way. If all y'all can wait, get them down the line. Let's give them a hand. Come on, let's give them a big hand. Come on.